white flash from the left side of the Oh my god! Oh my god! We're not This is 3 News with John Campbell and Carol Hirschfeld. Kia ora, good evening. Tonight, an extended 3 News as we bring you coverage of the horrific events in the United States. The death toll is in the thousands. No one really has any idea how many. But we can tell you that 266 people were aboard the four hijacked planes, all dead now. And it's estimated that 800 people died when one of the aircraft plowed into the Pentagon in Washington. But the big unknown is at the World Trade Center, where 50,000 people work, or at least used to work. This is the scene tonight, firefighters and police exhausted by the hours of struggle. It will be days, probably probably weeks before the loss of life is known. Well, today clearly saw a new form of terrorism emerge. Commercial aircraft hijacked at knife point and deliberately flown into their targets, symbols of America's power and wealth. With a huge gaping hole on the side of the building and billowing... A day that will live in infamy. 11th of September, 2001, 60 years after Pearl Harbor, the United States is again the victim of a brutal surprise attack. This time the aircraft are hijacked airliners, the targets, the very symbols of American financial power. Five miles from the site of this absolute disaster, we cannot... A tragic accident or a deliberate attack, as a second aircraft flew towards the Twin Towers, there was no longer any doubt. Loss. I mean, do you know if there were many people in the building? Oh, the another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane oh. just flew directly over my building and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I yes. can see it on this shot. Oh my. Something An else. image that will remain forever seared on the American consciousness. A passenger jet full of people being flown deliberately into one of the world's great skyscrapers. <laughs> on the streets below, utter pandemonium. <laughs> Well, From up in the towers, the heartbreaking sight of people trapped above the flames, almost a third of a mile high, waving desperately for help that would never, could never arrive. Less than an hour after the attacks, one of the towers finally succumbed to the blast and the flames. In blood. It looks like a lot of them were either on the floor of one of the exchanges. There's actually, oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it was another explosion on the far side of one of the buildings from where we're standing. The entire top of the building just collapsed. You can see the plume of smoke is coming in our direction. Let's get out of here, Ralph. We're going to leave because of... There is no indication how many people were evacuated before the collapse, nor of how many emergency service personnel may have been caught up in the millions of tons of falling concrete, steel and glass. A few minutes later, the second tower began to crumble. Fifty thousand people work in the Twin Towers. A hundred and fifty thousand visit them on an average day. It beggars the imagination how many people may now be lying dead in the rubble of Lower Manhattan. Physically, psychologically, New York City will never be the same. Skyscrapers, two of the defining characteristics of the Manhattan skyline, uh, they are no more, and one can scarcely comprehend the loss of life come down the steps everything fine till we got to the basement and everything just fell in uh, i got trapped in there with another guy crawled out kept getting hit in the head hit bags all around finally we clawed our way out over the rubble i was just standing here watching the world trade center after the first after the first plane hit i just saw a second plane come in from the south and hit the south tower halfway between the bottom and the top of the tower. It's got to be a, a terrorist attack. I can't tell you anything more than that. I saw the plane hit the building. And we heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out, and we saw the plane on the other side of the building, and there was smoke everywhere, and people are jumping out the windows. Over there, they're jumping out the windows, I guess, because they're trying to save themselves. I don't know. I was standing next to one World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden I heard rumbling, and we all started running away from it. The glass, like, blew out and threw me onto the sidewalk, and I, I couldn't see for, like, 20 seconds. And then I started seeing 
vaguely the street and I, I just started walking and I started, my eyesight came back. I see you're, you're bloody, you have dust all over you. Yeah, it was bad. It was like a dust storm or something. Like I couldn't see anything. How badly are you hurt? I have no idea. As soon as you got hit, I was thrown to a window. So I was very lucky to get out. There's a lot of people that didn't get out. There's a lot of people coming down the stairs, burnt up. It's, it's, it's bad. We just come out of Tower One. We're walking towards Broadway. They're saying, move along, move along, move along. I looked up as soon as we got across the street. I looked up, I saw the building start, the tower start to buckle. I just turned and ran, ducked down, put a jacket over my head. Three or four of us huddled together, and uh, it was just black everywhere. Were you covered? Were you hit with debris? No, 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 no. But I mean, I was ducked behind a subway cover. So I put a, you know, with the jacket over, the three of us, you know, all of us huddled together. There was, you know, dust and whatnot everywhere, but it was... can't even look at it, because all I can see are people. I don't see a building, I see people. People hurt. Children without mothers and fathers tonight. <laughs> but as the nation watched the horror of New York on live television, the assault moved to a second front. We saw the tail end of a large airliner plunge into the Pentagon. Another hijacked airliner, the third, flew across Washington, D.C., past the White House, and slammed into the Pentagon. The very heart of the American military colossus engulfed in flames, evacuated, left impotent by the most brutal act of terrorism in history. There was a tremendous explosion as it hit the Pentagon. I looked right, I looked over, and the, the smoke started coming up. The president was in Florida. He moved not to the White House, but to a strategic command center in Louisiana, from where he and his senior officers could coordinate a response. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. He will be under immense pressure to respond decisively and with force. It is unlikely, though, that he will need much encouragement. As military jets patrolled the skies above the capital, all fingers were being pointed accusingly at the terrorist network of Saudi fugitive Osama bin Laden, considered the only one with the resolve and the resources to carry out such a well-planned, coordinated, audacious attack. Fingers are being pointed, too, at the American intelligence services for their abject failure to predict or forestall what happened here today. But that is for later. Today, this is a nation numb with shock and disbelief. If they're not safe in the World Trade Center, not safe even in the Pentagon, they are now learning they are not safe anywhere. After that report was filed, a third New York building collapsed. Known as Building 7 of the World Trade Center complex, the skyscraper sent up clouds of dust and rubble as it went down. Emergency crews had expected the building to collapse and it had been evacuated. Flames and smoke were seen spewing from the office tower before it fell. Most of the buildings in the complex were built in the early 70s. Well, 3 News reporter Wendy Petrie is in New York. It was Wendy who woke us this morning with a phone call about 1 a.m. saying someone had flown a plane into the World Trade Center. 17 hours after that first impact, how is the mighty city of New York coping now? Wendy, hello to you. What's it like there tonight? Well, John, during the day, as we've seen, there's been utter devastation and chaos. But tonight, a sort of airy silence has descended over the whole of New York City. And that's probably because, basically, if the city is shut down. You cannot get in, you cannot get out. And people are standing on lookouts, just looking over in utter disbelief, sort of saying, why has this happened? How has this happened? And who is responsible? Wendy, can you paint a picture for us? What's the scene there? Uh, is the police presence very high, for example? Oh, very, very high, John. I've been driving around New York City today and there are police on every single corner. They are stopping anyone that looks remotely suspicious. I saw two men get arrested about an hour ago. So basically, if you look suspicious, they will stop you. They are out to find the perpetrator of these crimes. 
Wendy, is there a sort of sense of vigilante justice building? Do they want to finger somebody? Do they want to do it fast? And does it matter terribly much who it is? Well, we've heard George Bush today saying they want to track down uh, the, pe the perpetrators of these crimes. And certainly on the streets, we hear people saying, you know, let's find out who did this. And, you know, we've got to get them back for what they've done. And earlier today, when I talked to you at 1.30 in the morning, mm. they said, you know, the P Palestinian militia group was responsible. And now we're hearing Osama bin Laden. Uh, so, you know, but once again, looking back to Oklahoma, you know, you, we could look within. And it wasn't someone from without uh, at, at, at after all, was it? No. When is there a great deal of anger? or is there just an overwhelming sense of grief in New York now? I think there's a bit of both, John. I think uh, certainly grief and devastation, but also a great sense of anger. No one can believe it. This is uh, on uh, American soil. This is a direct hit on, you know, not only America, but the Western nations, and, and no one can quite believe it. Wendy, can we talk about this, the, the search for survivors? Are people being pulled from the rubbish, uh, rubble, do you know, or, or, or are no survivors being found? Well, uh, I heard people saying earlier today there were uh, dozens and dozens of ambulance, and then tonight uh, the, the number has dropped off, so I, uh, I take that as a bad sign that it means that there are fewer people being pulled out alive, and that is certainly a tragedy, and I'm sure that in, in due time we'll find out the death toll, and it is going to be high. It's uh, being speculated that it will be in the thousands. Is that what you're hearing there, Wend? That's right. Well, we know that uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, two, two and a half thousand people were killed in Pearl Harbor, and, and they're saying this is definitely going to be higher, the, uh, you know, the worst terrorist attack in, in history. Wendy Petrie from New York. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Wendy. Here in New Zealand, international flights have been cancelled or rescheduled as airports across America were closed. Auckland Airport staff have had to counsel distressed travellers and airport security and police are on high alert. Reporter Sarah Bradley joins us now from Auckland International Airport. Good evening, Sarah. Good evening, Carol. Well, air travellers were in shock today, some breaking down in tears as they arrived on flights here at Auckland International Airport and found out about the devastation back in the United States states. It was news almost too terrible to believe. Mass destruction and death on a mind-numbing scale. I just feel so sorry for it. It's horrific. What tragedy. Terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I just give thanks to God that we're here safely and I I want to pray for all those other families that are involved in that situation because, unfortunately, they're not as lucky as people. It is the worst that I've ever heard of, and, and such a cowardly act, and to kill innocent people. With America closing off its airspace and Britain imposing tight restrictions, some captains were ordered to turn their planes back to New Zealand. I don't think it sunk in exactly what had happened. Uh, he just said there was a terrorist attack. Yeah, I just thought it must be something pretty big, you know, to close all the airspace, considering we were going to uh, LA. There was news, too, that one of the hijacked and deliberately crashed United Airlines planes had a code-share agreement to carry Air New Zealand passengers. At this point, our information tells us no Air New Zealand ticketed passengers on that code-shared flight. Today, American travellers were divided on what their president should do, but at least one woman's convinced Muslim fundamentalist Osama bin Laden is to blame. Quit being a gentleman and go after that character. It's not a matter of retaliating, it's a matter of bringing people to justice. Security at the international airport has also been significantly boosted, with both police and the airport's own security personnel making their presence felt. Sarah, you've been at the airport on and off for most of the day. What's the mood like there right now? Well, I just came out from being in the airport just before. I would say I would describe the mood as quiet and very somber. There are very few people in there. Flights are arriving and of course now people know what's happened in the United States so they're very somber as they get off planes. This morning of course people didn't know planes that were coming from the United States. People on those planes were not told about what had happened. I guess they thought it would be better for them to land and then police got on the planes and told them about the devastation. So this morning shock and tears. Right now quiet and sombre. How extensively will today's events affect New Zealand travellers, Sarah? 
Well, they're going to affect travellers quite extensively. Of course, people cannot leave New Zealand and travel to America, business travellers and, of course, uh, people going for holidays. But also remember, it's going to affect people who are already in America. There's no travelling within America. There's no travelling out of America. And, of course, what about tourists here, American tourists, who can't get back home? So there's really going to be quite a lot of disruption. Uh, America, uh, the United States is telling us that they <coughs> expect maybe their airspace will be opened tomorrow morning our time. But I just spoke to airport staff here and they said they have not heard anything officially and as far as they're concerned all flights are cancelled indefinitely. We understand there were a couple of Air New Zealand flights diverted. There, yeah, there were two flights diverted today. The first flight was NZ2 that was going from Auckland to Los Angeles and that was diverted back again to Auckland so they never got there. Those people were told on the flight what, is, what had happened so they were aware of the devastation although not the effect of it and they said when they got off and they saw the television screens in the duty-free lounge they were all absolutely shocked. The other flight that was diverted was NZ54 which was from Rarotonga to Los Angeles that was actually diverted to Tahiti and Air New Zealand tells us that they are now working on getting those passengers back to their homes whether they be Auckland or perhaps Rarotonga. On a personal note, Sarah, you used to live in New York and work near the World Trade Centre. Do you remember discussion about the possibility of something like this happening? Yeah, this is, this is very difficult for me personally. I actually only just got back from living for 10 years in New York six months ago. And I used to walk through that World Trade Centre concourse every morning around 9 o'clock. And since the 93 bombing, of course, of the World Trade Center, the Oklahoma bombing, and, of course, the terrorist attacks on Af uh, American embassies in Africa, everyone's been very nervous. All people who work down there in those financial companies have been very nervous over the last couple of years. We always thought we were a target. I mean, you know, the financial capital of the world, a place where over 50,000 people work. And so there was always a sense that terrorists would target the World Trade Center in New York City. And tell me, have you been able to get through to friends today? Luckily, I have gotten through to most of my close friends over in New York and everyone is safe. But there are still some people I haven't heard from that I worked with. Of course, I work with a lot of colleagues uh, in, at companies in the World Trade Centre, lawyers, uh, financial firms. So I am very concerned and it's very hard to get through to America at the moment with the phone lines. Reporter Sarah Bradley from Auckland International Airport. Thanks for joining us. Well, we're joined now by Acting Prime Minister Jim Anderton, who's at Parliament in Wellington. Thanks for joining us, Mr Anderton. Fine, John. What an awful day for humanity, eh? Well, it is. Uh, as I said, I think this morning, this wasn't just a blow against America. It was a blow against humanity. And uh, as the news has come in and the casualty toll inevitably looks completely disastrous, one can't just uh, wonder what on earth we've reduced ourselves to as humankind when the anger and hatred is so great that this mindless, uh, insane terrorism, uh, it, which, which destroys innocent people in, in huge numbers, is somehow put up as uh, a weapon for a cause, whatever that cause might be. I can't imagine that the cause has done itself any good today. Mr Anderton, do we know about the fate of any New Zealanders working in the World Trade Centre? No, we don't. We, we can uh, in some ways say that no news is good news, but the mm. truth is there's very little news about any casualties. Uh, we have been checking all day as to whether there are any New Zealand companies in the World Trade Centre. I haven't got any information that confirms that there is any, except that anecdotally we know there are a lot of New Zealanders working for international mm. and United States companies in the World Trade Centre, just as your reporter was talking about, uh, and it's almost beyond belief that we would have escaped unscathed. I would imagine there are not many nationalities or countries in the world that have escaped uh, some kind of problem as a result of this catastrophe. What about the search for a perpetrator? This is a natural thing to do, I guess. Are people jumping the gun? Do we have any idea really who it was? Well, we don't. Uh, the agencies that we have, our security agencies, are, of course, in touch with their brother and sister agencies throughout the world and in America. I would imagine that the uh, United States Security Services will be going through the uh, passenger list of those aircraft with a fine tooth comb, and you wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that they will find out who 
the odd people out in those uh, in those passenger lists are. It's inconceivable, for example, that there weren't pilots on that plane uh, as terrorists who, or a pilot, because the way those planes were flown, they were flown with great deliberation and, dare I say it, without any admiration, skill. And uh, the planes were powered into those buildings. They weren't just striking them, glancing blows. They were meant to be death blows, and of course they were. Jim Anderson, very quickly, is there anything in real terms that New Zealand can do to help people in New York? I, I doubt it. And New York is, you know, three, four times bigger than the whole of New Zealand, mm. and the United States is many, many times bigger than New Zealand. So they have the resources to cope. I think uh, the United States will be comforted to know that for all of the disagreements there are around the world from time to time with, with such a large and powerful nation, the whole world is united behind the American people in their hour of need. Uh, there is enormous sympathy pouring out towards them. In Wellington here, spontaneous bouquets of flowers at the United States Embassy and a huge um, uh, welling up, I think, of of support for for a nation that is under siege, no question, but it is a powerful and a proud nation. Its flags are flying here in, in, in Wellington, and I think we'll see uh, America emerge from this, and New Zealand and all the other countries of the world who must strike a blow against terrorism permanently if we're to have any sense of peace and contentment as an international community will and must stand behind them. Jim Anderton, Acting Prime Minister, live from Wellington. Thank you very much indeed. Special church services were held in several parts of New Zealand today so people could pray for the victims and their relatives and friends. About 80 people attended the service at Auckland's Tabernacle Baptist Church. Workers on their lunch breaks and passers-by listened as the pastor called for New Zealanders to share the burden of those suffering. We pray that the hearts be tuned. We're going to take a break now, but don't go away. We'll be back shortly with reaction from the U.S. Embassy in Wellington, plus more coverage of the tragedy from America. And we pose the question, who's responsible? So now we've just received pictures of the first aircraft to crash into the World Trade Center. The cameraman was filming the emergency services, inspecting a drain, believe it or not, when a low-flying plane catches his attention. The passenger jet explodes into a fireball after it crashes into the tower. As you can see, it left a huge, gaping hole in the top quarter of the building. The U.S. Embassy in Wellington quickly battened down the hatches after today's attacks. Like American embassies all over the world, Wellington's went into siege mode. Reporter Tony Field is there. Good evening, Tony. Evening, Carol. It's really been a day reminiscent of the scenes when Princess Diana died. You'll see behind me the flowers. People have been coming here to the U.S. Embassy all day. Signs of a common grief and mourning. The stars and stripes at half-mast and New Zealand flowers at the embassy's gates. Throughout the day, ordinary New Zealanders came to offer their sympathy, struggling to comprehend what happened. Well, I'm overcome with grief for the, for the American people. I just, um, like everyone, I'm just overcome. I just can't um, understand it. People dying, it's just, it's a horrific. It's just a, it's an attack. It's Pearl Harbor. Armed police joined security guards patrolling the grounds. Although no one will say so officially, every American government official is a potential terrorist target. Staff arrived for work clearly stunned by what had happened. Uh, it's horrible. I mean, what else can you say? It's, you know, 50,000 people could be dead. Uh, it's just a terrible scene. One U.S. citizen now studying in New Zealand says she feared this would happen. Um. Well, I'm a Gulf War veteran, and uh, I worked um, with the Middle East throughout my four years in the military. Uh, this morning, my reaction was, this is my worst nightmare come true. Um, many of the countries in the Middle East declared war on us a long time ago, and I feel like our political leaders really didn't take them very seriously. And today, they proved that they were very serious. It kind of hit me at one point that those, that those are people that possibly people I might know or have seen every day on the train or something like that that just, you know, died in a giant heap of 
trouble, I don't know. The flowers kept coming, and for embassy staff, comfort came with them on a dreadful day. Today, we've had a national tragedy. Freedom itself was attacked by a faceless coward. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the government of New Zealand and to all those who have called, or as you see here, have brought flowers to express their sympathy. It's very gratifying to see the strong bonds of friendship between our two countries. Other Americans, moved to tears, brought their own flowers as they struggled with anger and despair. Death is too good. Death is too easy for them. If they could suffer for every life that they took, it wouldn't be enough. Tony, the embassy is the obvious place for people to go for information. What's their latest advice? Well, their advice is that for the time being, most of the services they normally offer to the public have been suspended. For example, uh, visa applications are no longer being processed until further notice. However, the embassy says that any American citizens living here in New Zealand who have an emergency situation can contact the consulate office in Auckland. That number is available through directory services on 018. But the embassy is stressing that anybody who has any concerns or queries about relatives, friends living in the United States, Please don't phone either the embassy or the consulate office for the time being because all their phone lines are understandably being tied up dealing with this uh, crisis. You've spoken to lots of people coming and going there obviously, Tony. What's been the general mood? Very sombre mood and really a, a sense of utter disbelief. You know, people are you know, <laughs> struggling to really grasp you know, what has happened, to understand why anybody would do this. Interesting, you know, a number of people have likened this momentous occasion, the same emotions they say they felt when they heard the news in 1963 that uh, US President John Kennedy had been assassinated. Tony Field from the US Embassy in Wellington, thank you. Well, no one has claimed responsibility for the attacks, but the denials are coming thick and fast. The PLO and Afghanistan's Taliban have both expressed shock and said unequivocally it wasn't them. Osama bin Laden, a Saudi-born billionaire, has been waging a terrorist war against American interests from his base in Afghanistan. And his Islamic extremists may be the ones with the organization and the audacity to commit such an outrage. Last year, bin Laden's followers launched a suicide bomb attack against the USS Cole in the port of Aden, killing 17 sailors. And in August 1998, American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were bombed by bin Laden's extremists. 224 people died. The World Trade Center's towers had previously been attacked eight years ago, six people dying in a basement car bomb. Again, bin Laden's al-Qaeda organization was held responsible. They've attacked our embassies in Africa. The the, the uh, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But before you make any drastic decisions about retaliation, I think you have to make sure you have compelling evidence that it was the Al-Qaeda or, or organization. The United States, of course, has many enemies. Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi is one. And Iraq's Saddam Hussein has been engaged in a constant duel with American and British warplanes since the end of the Gulf War. In Arab parts of Jerusalem, some Palestinians celebrated when they heard news of the attacks, but Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat expressed shock and sorrow. First of all, I am offering my condolences, the condolences of uh, the Palestinian people to the, uh, to the American president, uh, President Bush, to his government to the American people for this terrible act. We are completely shocked, completely shocked. Unbelievable. Until today, this was the worst act of terrorism on American soil, the bombing in 1995 of the federal building in Oklahoma. 168 people were killed, but the perpetrator was American. Timothy McVeigh, who was later convicted and executed. 
But those responsible for this were surely not Americans, and the finger of blame must point to Islamic fundamentalists. Bin Laden declared clearly um, five years ago that uh, he will attack American uh, interests and American embassies and American troops in the Middle East. He issued a fatwa, which is Islamic ruling, calling to kill the American and to kill the Jews. Or, um, so uh, the man uh, declared his intention clearly. So when something big like this happened, usually the finger will point it at him. Now the most powerful intelligence and military operation in the world will redouble its effort to track down Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice. While well, no one is sure who's responsible for the tragedy, there are some leads. Numerous cell phone calls were made from the doomed flights before they crashed, describing people armed with box cutter knives. But it's one call in particular from an American Airlines flight attendant that may give investigators the information they need. The flight attendant was also able to tell the American Airlines Operations Center. She reached them and told them what was going on board. She was able to tell them the actual seat number of the passenger who was causing the problems on the plane. So that may lead authorities at least to one name, at least the name of the person who booked that ticket. Well, a mystery explosion in the Afghan capital, Kabul, briefly heightened suspicion that the mastermind behind today's attack was Osama bin Laden. The explosion came after the attacks on New York and Washington and was for a time believed to be an American response. But the U.S. Defense Secretary says the U.S. did not attack the city. Bin Laden, although a Saudi by birth, is based in Afghanistan. Until today, a terrorist attack on this scale was unthinkable. But every national security service is now hastily reviewing its ability to stop anything similar. Ultimately, though, the experts say they can offer no guarantee. July 1985, and the previously unthinkable happened. The target not an international symbol of capitalism, but one of peace, attacked by French government agents. The Rainbow Warrior showed we were vulnerable. And we still are. Well, anything could happen. If it can happen in the United States, it can happen here. We have no evidence to suggest, however, that New Zealand is a target, I have to say. That. You know, somebody could go in here to, down to Wellington Airport, jump on a 737 and crash into the Beehive. It's that simple. You don't have to be a great terrorist. You know what I mean? And that's, that's what's scary. An Air New Zealand first officer told 3 News no pilot would willingly crash a commercial flight into a building full of people. Well, we suspect that uh, they probably killed the crew. Would a pilot... Probably not. Be able to do that? Oh, I wouldn't think so. Well, I don't think he'd want to. I mean, he would. Uh, they, he'd, he'd have to be killed before they go in. I don't imagine. Victoria University lecturer Jim Veach studies terrorism. He says New Zealand's unlikely to be the target of such warfare. We're too far away, and unlike the U.S., don't get so involved policing other nations. I don't think New Zealand is important strategically. Yeah, this uh, clashes between America and her opponents principally in the Middle East. Opponents who, like the Oklahoma bomber Timothy McVeigh, want America to take responsibility for the pain they say it inflicts on people in the Middle East. A fire officer who helped clear up after that tragedy was in Wellington today and says New Zealand must be prepared for anything. When the crunch time comes, when that big incident comes, whether it's an earthquake or a terrorist attack or whatever, that you have uh, uh, you've planned on that and you know how to handle it when it comes up. That's insurance for emergency services. For travellers who are the victims of terrorist attacks, it's cold comfort to know that at least they won't have to fight their insurance company. Terrorism, unlike war zones, is covered by holiday insurance. Jill Newland, 3 News. Well, we're taking another break, but stay with us for this extended edition of 3 News, America Under Attack. <laughs> shaken by today's attack. Values plummeted on European and Asian stock markets while gold and oil prices surged upwards. Some economists fear a global recession may be triggered. We cross now live to Stephen Parker, our reporter who's on the trading floor at Deutsche Bank. As you can see, good evening, Stephen. Yes, good evening, John. There's no doubt there's been an enormous economic reverberation felt all around the globe. Just to give you some idea of the significance of this, this is the longest period the US markets have ever been shut since the Depression in the 1930s. And Tonight, those markets are still shut. As the stunned survivors staggered from the dust and debris of the Twin Towers, this shock destruction of the financial nerve center of America was felt around the globe. Just a kilometer away from the blast, the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ were immediately closed, sending all other share markets into a state of turmoil, starting on the other side of the Atlantic. 
the reaction was pronounced and despite calls for calm, it was fearsome. We saw a plunge in share prices. Uh, the benchmark index of Britain's largest 100 companies rapidly turned a 97-point gain into a 260-point loss. The London Exchange was abandoned and operated from another building as many finance workers fled the city. We've been speaking to them this morning, like normally, and the next minute we know there's people, you know, put the phones down and... because the planes have gone into the building. I mean, we know people in those buildings. So, I just think it's terrible. Across Europe and Asia, most stock markets reeled with an immediate loss of 5 to 10 per cent in value. The US dollar also plunged, while gold and oil prices surged. In New Zealand, the stock exchange opened an hour later than usual and also slumped by 5 per cent. Bad news, but better than early fears that the global financial system was about to collapse. Uh, some of the initial concerns about the international financial system uh, appear not to have eventuated. There was major concern that some of the uh, settlements processes might be very severely disrupted. The US economy is already fragile and sliding into a recession. It's possible this terrorist attack could trigger a worldwide economic slump. That is a risk for the world economy. All depends on how the consumer in the United States reacts. Uh, if the United States remains weaker for longer, that will affect Europe, Asia and ultimately New Zealand. All eyes will be on the American Federal Reserve to see how it protects the US economy. But back here, one early concern is that tourism is likely to suffer. There will no doubt be tightening of security on travel and all sorts of things which, which may cause economic impacts. Um, no doubt in the short term this will impact quite severely in areas like tourism and so on. The people may have second thoughts about flying. Uh, all those sorts of things will occur. Um, but in basic terms, the, the system seems to come through this test a little bit better than we feared. And with the green back in a slide and all flights into the United States still on hold and many of the world's leading finance houses obliterated by this blast, its economic consequences will be felt for a long time yet. Stephen, just how serious has this been for world markets? Well, you wouldn't want to overstate it and you certainly wouldn't want to understate it. The immediate reaction was a very sharp one for the markets. Many lost 5% uh, just like that on a global scale. That's billions and billions of dollars in value lost instantly. There's been a certain amount of resilience, but the New Zealand stock market's a good example. Ended the day 5% down. Uh, and what's really concerning everyone now, and I guess this is where the analysis will come in, is just what impact that's going to have on the US economy. We've been uh, hearing this talk about uh, an imminent recession mm -hmm. in the United States. Have we now got the trigger that is going to set off an American recession? And certainly that would have a global impact. Stephen, from the people you've been talking to, what's the feeling about the areas that will hurt the most? Well, I suppose there's a general question about overall production. If you're seeing the oil uh, prices going up by uh, a, a certain amount, that's going to have some impact. Uh, we're hearing reports in the United States, for example, there's some panic buying, concerns over the oil supply. Uh, the prices in California have jumped up by 20 cents a gallon. Uh, so that's one certain area, the general overall production. Uh, aviation and tourism are two areas of real concern. British Airways lost 20% on their shares immediately today. Uh, um, if there's a general global loss of confidence in aviation and flying, tourism here will be hurt. And certainly it's uh, something that is uh, coming at a very bad time for Air New Zealand as, as, as it's trying to climb off its knees. If there is this uh, downturn in tourism, loss of confidence in aviation is going to hurt companies like Air New Zealand and overall our tourism industry. Yes, we'll have more on Air New Zealand later, but in the meantime, Stephen Parker from Deutsche Bank in downtown Auckland. Thank you. News of the New York disaster has prompted special newspaper editions in New Zealand today. The Otago Daily Times, normally a morning paper, rolled its presses early this afternoon to put out a paper featuring some of the pictures and stories from New York. 25,000 copies were distributed free around Otago. Well, in Parliament today, the attack on America was being compared to World War II. Political reporter Jen Nolan was in the House. Good evening, Jen. Good evening, Carol. Well, the level of outrage and horror was evident in the members' speeches today. The unknown perpetrators were compared to Hitler, and the victim's fate was likened to the Holocaust. A minute's silence before the House began its business, as politicians reflected on the horror of this morning's events. Adam. 
Acting Prime Minister Jim Anderton then led the special statements made by every party leader. As the nation gathered around radios and televisions and tried to make sense of this, I believe that a shared determination has grown. A determination felt by all dis decent people that the per perpetrators of this violence must be brought swiftly to justice. <coughs> Nationals Bill English spoke of a holocaust of innocent civilian victims. We also look to the strengths of the United States as they respond, their sense of justice and their sense of outrage. We applaud the message of President Bush that this free nation stands unbowed and that the perpetrators will be found and punished. Finance Minister Michael Cullen spoke for Labor. It is hard to understand how anybody can believe that their cause, whatever it may be, is advanced by such actions. Richard Preble was the only one who saw it as a chance to score political points. I was at Eden Park, or more correctly, outside Eden Park, on the day when one Karl Marx Jones hijacked a Cessna plane and flower-bombed that park. The Air Force actually considered shooting down his plane. Preble pointed out with the sale of the Skyhawks, from December on, the Air Force wouldn't have that option. But the Greens had a warning. Even when the perpetrators are identified, and they must be punished, we would urge restraint and insist that a rash and violent response will only increase the loss of life, especially of the innocent. Winston Peters spoke of a world that is irrevocably changed. Tomorrow's world will be, sadly, at the start of the 21st century, a very different place because of today's events. Mr. And Speaker, United Futures' Peter Dunn echoed the, the feeling of many. Where the somewhat superficial, surreal and horrific world of the blockbuster movie became a grim and tragic reality. Jen, where's Helen Clark in all this? Well, she's been briefed throughout the day by telephone from officials here in New Zealand. She's just landed in Rome. Uh, she uh, landed within the last hour and will be briefed by New Zealand diplomats at the embassy there in Rome. She's actually considering coming home. The conference, which was to be the focal point of this trip, uh, the Progressive Governance Conference, has been cancelled. That was to be held in Sweden. Cancelled because of today's events. And so she may just come home. For once, this didn't seem to be just an occasion for political grandstanding, Jen. No, it really wasn't. There was a, a palpable feeling of solemnity and even unity in the House today. All the leaders referred to the fact that the world will be changed from now on after the events of this morning. They all spoke of the fact that the attack wasn't just against the United States of America, but indeed against every Western democratic society, including us. Richard Preble pointed out that we are the first uh, democratic parliament here in New Zealand to resume sitting after the attack. And there was a real feeling that it must be business as usual that these terrorists had targeted uh, Western democracies and that we must be seen to getting on with the, be getting on with the business of democracy. Jen Nolan from Parliament, thank you. Well, Australian Prime Minister John Howard was in Washington when the Pentagon was attacked. Indeed, his hotel was within sight of the Pentagon. He's now been moved for security reasons to the house of the Australian ambassador. The Prime Minister was holding a news conference at his Washington Hotel only minutes after the catastrophe in New York when terror struck again only three kilometres away at the Pentagon. Through a window in the room next door to Mr Howard, flames and smoke could be seen suddenly billowing from the nerve centre of the US military, the site of a third major terrorist attack. Mr Howard was there only the day before. As US soldiers and police took control of Washington streets, American Secret Servicemen and Australian federal agents immediately evacuated the Prime Minister from his hotel. As the White House, just across the park from Mr Howard's hotel, was also evacuated, he was rushed to the safe haven of the Australian Embassy ten blocks away. Secret agents unloading semi-automatic weapons and sealing the building. All non-essential personnel of the 80-member staff was sent home. A clearly moved Prime Minister emerged three hours later to express his horror at what he called an act of war. America has been hurt by today's events, but the American spirit will not be daunted or bowed or diminished by these events. Mr Howard announced he'd sent a message to US President George W Bush assuring him of Australia's support. 
Here the government set up an 0800 number for New Zealanders wishing to inquire about or report missing relatives in New York and Washington. That number is 0800 872 111. That's 0800 872 111 for the New Zealand Police and Foreign Affairs Helpline. So this Thursday night on the panel... Too close for comfort for an Auckland man who was flying past the building when the second hijacked aircraft tore into it. As the inferno unfolded, Grant Scanlon feared for his life, not knowing whether his plane was a terrorist target too. Pictures that have shocked the world and a scene that was witnessed firsthand from the air by ex-Aucklander Grant Scanlon aboard a United Airlines domestic flight over New York. It's just this huge uh, orange burst of flame and uh, a plume of black smoke. If I was, uh, I was pretty scared. Um, when you're up there in the air, not knowing what's going on, you can see, you know, a couple of uh, the World Trade Center towers on fire. And all you want to do is be on the ground pretty quick. Scanlon's worked and lived in Chicago as a computer consultant for the last three years. He was flying to New York on business. All of a sudden, we just the plane uh, had been descending. Uh, pilot cut to full power, and the plane just uh, ascended really quickly. I mean, like you know, emergency power. And um, the pilot came back on the PA and said, "Well, in case you haven't already figured it out, we have to divert to Philadelphia International because of a, a terrorist attack on New York City." Those aboard the plane thought they were a possible target. At that stage, of course, everyone in the plane is. Uh, freaking out. You know, I felt like a sitting duck. I was looking, I was peering out the window trying to find anything that might you know, conceivably be coming our way. 32-year-old Scanlon had only been back in the States a week after visiting family in Auckland. Fearing for his own life, family was his first thought. As soon as I heard the word terrorist attack, I phoned my wife um, because you know, if, if our plane was going to be involved, then I wanted her to be the last person I spoke to. Scanlon's plane landed safely in Philadelphia and he's now back in New York and planning to stay on the ground for a long time. Jeff Hampton, 3 News. Well, Grant Scanlon was by no means the only New Zealander to witness the World Trade Centre disaster. Others were on the ground, dangerously close to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Indeed, saved only because they were running late for work. Oh my God, there it goes! These scenes of chaos, replayed repeatedly today, were what greeted New Zealander Raina Webster when she awoke this morning. But it wasn't television pictures. She watched the real thing from the roof of her Manhattan Island apartment. But it was everyone in the street crying and even, you know, all through Brooklyn, everyone poured out of their homes and were on roofs, kind of embracing each other and trying to support, you know, it's horrifying. On leaving Manhattan Island later, she described a group of parents anxiously waiting at the train station. They were obviously looking for their loved ones, and they were surveying the train to see if they'd get off. Right. And they weren't there, and so they were breaking down, and that was horrifying. It's like a, it's like a war zone, it really is. Cameron Childs is on his OE and had a sleep in this morning, instead of going with his original plan. As, as it would happen today, I had planned to go to the Twin Towers today at 9 a.m. in the morning. I was very relieved to believe you, mate. It's, very, it's been a long day. Another late sleeper, Craig Gribble, works in the financial trade building at the World Trade Centre. He's thankful he was running late for work and was still at home when the attack happened. It's hard to believe these people were just going to work this morning like I would have been. And yeah, quite shocking. Journalist Ray Lamb spent the morning asking people in the streets for their stories. This from a priest she met. Uh, he'd been into a church down there. One of the first casualties that he was aware of was, in fact, another priest, the fire service chaplain. Um, the body had been brought to one of the churches that's still standing, not too far from where the towers were, and uh, apparently uh, also a senior fire officer's body was there as well, and, and the floor of the church, he said, was covered in blood. So, very distressing scenes. No one knew what to expect in the hours following the disaster, and at the office of the New Zealand Consul General, staff took the obvious precautions. You know, there certainly was a sense of panic. Uh, not panic, but there was a sense of uh, don't be in a tall building. Get get down to the basement, get down to the street level. Um, it's not safe to be up high. And, and indeed, our, we, we got all our staff out of here. Although there won't be flights to New Zealand for a few days, it won't make a difference to the Kiwis we spoke to. They all said they won't allow the disaster to change their plans. Sharon Ferguson, 3 News.
Joining us now live from Dunedin is Dr. Robert Patman, a senior lecturer at Otago University and an expert on American policy and international foreign relations. Dr. Patman, thanks for joining us. Good evening, John. Hello. Let's talk about America's security intelligence system. It's so expensive, $30 billion worth, so high-tech and clearly so ineffectual, they had no warning at all that this was going to happen. Yes, the United States seems to be being caught cold by the devastating events of today. Um, and it seems that uh, the administration will certainly be reviewing in the next uh, days and weeks ahead uh, its intelligence apparatus. Uh, there have been calls already beginning to grow in Washington for heads to roll mm. and uh, it, perhaps the director of the CIA in particular will come under some pressure. However, we have to qualify that slightly by saying we don't know at this early stage whether the information about this threat was actually in the intelligence system but it hadn't actually reached the desks of the, the key decision makers and uh, the other possibility is that the Americans had the information in their intelligence system but they in fact may have been preoccupied with one or two particular threats such as bin Laden and uh, may have therefore neglected information already in the system. Robert, can we look forward? What are the implications of this for Star Wars, for George W. Bush's missile defence system? Well, I think they're pretty negative actually. Uh, one of the sobering things which uh, emerges from this, that this, cri uh, this the crisis of the last uh, 12, 24 hours or so, is that even if Mr Bush, say in 2005, had his uh, anti-missile uh, shield in place, it would have been powerless to prevent mm. this type of terrorism. Because it's so unsophisticated in some respects, men with knives stealing planes and flying them into buildings. Star Wars is not in that league, is it? Well, it's, uh, Star Wars is predicated on the notion that uh, rogue states, as the Americans call them, that's uh, states which uh, have considerable conflicts of interest in the United States, would, such as uh, North Korea, Iran or Iraq, might launch ballistic missiles in the United States. Mm. The United States has to be geared to protect that. Whereas, in fact, I think the reality of conflict in the post-Cold War world is increasingly non-state groups are looking uh, to mount uh, terrorist uh, acts via um, uh, sort of acts we've seen today through hijacking planes mm. or delivering bombs through, through lorries. Can we look at the politics of it? George W. Bush's mm. response, so far one brief speech in a sort of Churchillian mode. What does he have to do? Well, I thought he struck the right tone as far as the American public were probably concerned today. It was defiant. Uh, but I think Mr. Bush faces perhaps the most formidable test of his presidency mm. in the days mm. ahead. He's someone who's not steeped in foreign policy. Uh, some Americans are quite nervous about how dependent he is on his advisers. And if his advisers are divided on their response to this problem, then that might contribute to a slight incoherence mm. within the United States uh, foreign policy making with respect to this crisis. But we will have to await developments to see that. Robert, just quickly, has the extent of the hatred for America displayed in this action surprised you? No, I think there's been a fair degree of animus towards the United States uh, in a number of countries. And I think uh, what Mr Bush has to do, as well as go after the people who are responsible for this appalling uh, uh, tragedy, this wanton, this dastardly act that we've seen in the last 24 hours, which cannot be condoned at all, I think Mr Bush also has to look at some of the causes which terrorist groups are feeding off uh, in the world. And when I talk about causes, I mean those people who have not had a fair deal out of the international system and who, in fact, are alienated from it. And I think America perhaps has to be more energetic in particular in trying to bring in a more even-handed fashion peace to the Middle East. Dr Robert Patman from our Dunedin studio, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Robert. Thank you. Well, there's no way of telling at this stage just how many lives have been lost in today's terrorist attack. All we know is that it will run easily into the tens of thousands and probably beyond. But when the numbers are confirmed, the majority won't be directly from the attacks, but from the collapse of the Twin Towers. Why did the towers collapse as quickly and as suddenly as they did? Engineers from the original firm that built the towers told ABC they can only guess at this point, but they believe that the collisions themselves, the plane hitting building number one and the plane that smashed into building number two, oh my God! by themselves, they did not cause the collapse. It was the fire, they say, the intense fire and heat from the explosions that brought the buildings down. Temperatures inside could have built up to 15, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, steel loses its strength and steel beams connect every floor to the outside walls. 
As it got hotter, the beams got weaker, and the hot air inside began to push and press against the outside walls until the outside walls just buckled, snapped, and released the top floor, which fell onto the floor below, and the entire building sinks in a straight vertical, the floors falling faster and faster down. Until you notice that every floor in the building is gone. Viewed from another angle, you can see the same thing. Notice the aerial stays vertical, just stays straight as it sinks into the building. There's no buckling or tipping, just straight down. And this happened in both buildings. The first tower, too, stayed straight as it went down, each floor falling neatly on top of the other. So the reason the towers went so quickly is because all the floors were literally hanging onto the skin. And once the skin went, the buildings went, too. The ABC's Robert Krolwich with that report. Just a reminder of the 0800 phone line set up here for New Zealand. This morning's terrorist attacks were carefully aimed at two of America's most strategic targets, its economic and its military headquarters. The first plane crashed into one of the twin towers of the World Trade Center at 12.45 a.m. New Zealand time, and it set off a sequence of events that have rocked the United States to the core. Two of the hijacked planes were American Airlines jets. Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles with 92 people on board and Flight 77 from Washington to LA with 64 people. At 8.50, just before 12.45 a.m. here, as workers were arriving for a day at the World Trade Center, one of the hijacked planes crashed into the World Trade Building. At 9.08, the other plane crashed into the tower, causing an inferno. At 9.30, yet another plane crashed, this time at the Pentagon in Washington, the nerve center of the American military establishment. Fifteen minutes later, the White House was evacuated. At 9.59, an hour after the first plane hit the trade center, one of its towers collapsed. At 10.25, over an hour and a half after the initial attack, a car bomb exploded outside the State Department. Three minutes later, the second tower at the World Trade Center also collapsed. The center has towered over New York for decades. It imploded, showering one of the world's most populated cities with smoke and debris. In the aftermath of the attack, the Federal Aviation Authority closed down the whole U.S. air transport system. But by then, it was too late. Ingrid Leary, 3 News. It was a day of intense emotion for New Yorkers. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani congratulated his city for its response, but it'll be a long time before the residents of the Big Apple deal with what they saw and experienced today. As the upper floors of the Trade Center towers burned, inside, employees scrambled to escape. For the 82nd floor, and I don't know where my peers are. I don't know. I hope to God they're okay. And so I can say, I don't know what... We saw a shadow, it looked like a plane. Next thing we know, it was boom, and the floor started shaking. And then we saw debris fall down, and next thing we know, we had to get out of the building. And we stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. On the street, New Yorkers looked up and watched in horror. And then we saw the people jumping. We saw what we thought was debris, and we realized it was people jumping. I started seeing people um, just uh, they started jumping out of the window, like at the 96th floor. They just started um, one at a time from different parts of the building. I just started seeing the people just drop, drop, and drop. And uh, I must have counted like 30 or 40 people, you know. Rescue workers raced to the scene. But then, some 90 minutes after the attack... Oh, my God, there it goes! Get out of here! Soot and rubble were everywhere. And with it, chaos. scared me the most was the panic and people were running and you just saw this great big cloud of um, dust just coming from the center of the building and, and, and mushrooming out uh, towards the, the river. There was, uh, people had no place to go. People were going to jump in the river. 
they were going to swim, they, they were jumping on a boat, they were breaking, I mean, breaking glass to get into uh, nearby homes and restaurants. You okay, officer? Firefighters and police officers found themselves momentarily helpless. Trained to save others, they suddenly had to save themselves. It's a war. We've been, uh, we've been attacked. It's, uh, it's like World War II. It's World War II. It's, uh, this is unbelievable. Tonight, crews are standing by to start searching for the thousands of people feared missing in the debris. Well, imagine a clear blue New York sky, one of the most famous buildings in the world, and then from nowhere, at great speed, a plane that had become a missile. The following defining shot is not the work of a big network operator, but that of a freelance cameraman standing directly beneath the World Trade Center. In a day filled with images we may never forget, this one stands out. The extraordinary footage of an American Airlines jet slicing through the number two tower of the World Trade Center. That image was captured by 40-year-old freelance cameraman Evan Fairbanks, who had been working two blocks away. I suddenly saw a white flash from the left side of the frame, and, I, and it lasted long enough for me to be able to identify it as a, as a jet. When you saw that plane hitting the Trade Center Tower, could you actually fathom what you were viewing? Not at all. It was very surreal. I felt like I was in another dimension, and uh, you know, we weren't even on the same planet. I guess as the human stories start to emerge, and, and we see more people, and we hear more names, um, it'll become a lot more real to me. But right now, I feel like I'm still in the bubble of, of the day, and, and uh, you know, the whole experience is just kind of numbing. Fairbanks has been a cameraman for 16 years, but today, he wasn't operating on experience. It was instinct. And that's what drew him back for one last shot. That's when the tower began to collapse. I was looking in the viewfinder, and I just saw the, this reverse mushroom cloud billowing down, and I realized my proximity, and immediately just turned and started running north. But for Evan Fairbanks, this is the image that will haunt him, and us, for the rest of our lives. The image of, of that plane just coming out of nowhere, coming into the frame and disappearing into the side, into the south side of the tower as if a floor had been hollowed out and it was a hangar that it was just landing in. We've seen these images in movies and we know that it's all artificial and Hollywood makes it. And it's hard to put together that it's real this time. Well, ITN's reporter in Washington is James Mates. He was just a few blocks from the Pentagon when the plane hit there. I spoke to him earlier, very much under discussion in Washington, the, uh, the idea, the issue of how a $30 billion security intelligence system, that's 70 billion New Zealand dollars, which is supposed to prevent such things from happening, didn't even provide a warning. Indeed, John, a catastrophic failure of intelligence, of that there is no doubt. Now, people uh, are holding back from uh, recriminating or pointing fingers at this stage because of the enormity of what's happened today, but very, very serious questions will have to be answered. It is believed that uh, Osama bin Laden and his uh, terrorist group based in Afghanistan were behind this. Uh, the United States Intelligence Services are well aware of what he's done in the past, well aware of what he's tried but failed to do. Uh, it can only be assumed that a very large part of their anti-terrorist resources were directed against him uh, and his operatives, and yet there appears to have been absolutely no warning, hint or indication of something of this scale. The simultaneous hijacking from different airports of four airliners and then the targeting of these high-profile uh, high-profile buildings. Uh, it's the, the worst failure in U.S. intelligence, obviously, since Pearl Harbor. James, obviously, people want to finger the person who's responsible or the group who's responsible, and the finger does seem to be pointing at Osama bin Laden. How confident are sources in Washington that he is the man, or is that just the natural inclination to blame someone? 
Well, uh, very much everybody's finger is pointing in his direction. Uh, how much of that is a desire simply to blame someone, it's hard to say. But of course, this is the man who's threatened to do exactly this, who's tried to carry out these sort of attacks, particularly against airliners before, but has failed, who has already attacked uh, the uh, World Trade Center before. Uh, who's attacked, made with similar suicide bomb type attacks against the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania and against the USS Cole. So uh, even from a layman's point of view, it has his fingerprints all over it. James, what's the mood like in Washington? What, uh, what are people saying there? Well, absolute shock and disbelief. Uh, we were in our office this morning when the, the, the first incident happened. No one knew if it was a, simply a, a tragic accident or if it was something deliberate. Then as we watched that second plane uh, crash into it and suddenly became clear what was going on, uh, down on the streets here people were talking about it and then suddenly there was this attack here in just, just a, a, a mile or two away at the Pentagon and people were in almost panic saying what on earth is, is happening here, where is it going to stop, who's next, news that the whole of the federal government had shut down, the White House, the Capitol evacuated and this is all unprecedented. Uh, the United States has suffered nothing like this for 60 years, since 1941. Most people obviously don't begin to remember that, uh, although uh, it, it's in the folklore. Uh, but now they've lived through a day like the 7th of December 1941. Uh, and without a doubt, it's a day that none of us here in the heart of it would ever forget. James, just briefly, this will define George W. Bush's presidency, how he responds to this, won't it? He has to find both the words and the actions. This is the time when presidents are tested. Uh, Bill Clinton went through it with the Oklahoma bombing, although, of course, he didn't have to find a response as soon as it became clear that this was a domestic attack. Uh, Bush has not only to find the right words when he addresses the nation this evening, he then has to find the right response, it's sufficient, proportionate, accurate, he has got to do something which satisfies people here, that those uh, who uh, conducted these appalling attacks have been gone after and punished. And anything less than that, he may find it hard to recover from. It really will define his presence. Etienne's James Mates from Washington. Thank you for joining us, James. Well, that completes our coverage of the terrorist attacks for the moment. And we're going to look now at the other big news story of the day.